This is Selma Schimmel at ASCO 2011. Conversations are going on here, and now we're going to sit with Dr. Sonali Smith, who was with us last year. And you are Associate Professor of Medicine, University of Chicago Medical Center. You are also a member of the ASCO Cancer Communications Committee. I want to welcome you back. Thank you so much for inviting me back, Selma. I had a lot of fun with this last year, and uh, really enjoy being here again. Are there any other points or thoughts or studies being presented here that you want to take a minute to highlight? There are other blood cancers that uh, also had some really uh, interesting findings and results presented and the one I really would like to talk about is myelofibrosis. And myelofibrosis or primary myelofibrosis is a very uncommon disorder, maybe about 5,000 to 7,000 new cases per year in the United States but it is a disease where the bone marrow, which is basically the liquid part inside your bones, uh, it's a factory that makes everything that travels in your blood, all your red cells, your white cells, and your platelets. In primary myelofibrosis, the bone marrow uh, compartment gets scarred down by these things called reticulin fibers. So if you can imagine that this factory suddenly just keeps getting scarred and scarred and scarred, and you can't make the things that travel in your blood. So what the body's response to that is, if you can't make the blood in your bone marrow, it then makes it in your spleen. And the spleen is an organ that tucks in underneath your left rib cage and normally helps filter your blood. But in this disease, it becomes the bone marrow. So it can get huge and to the point where it will fill up your entire belly. And just to give you a visual example of this, I had a lovely woman I took care of maybe seven or eight years ago who had primary myelofibrosis and she was in her 80s and looked like she was nine months pregnant because her spleen size had grown so much. Do patients mm -hmm. first then present with this um, distended or swollen abdomen? Is that what brings them to the doctor? That is a very common sign is that their spleen is getting larger. Sometimes their blood counts will look abnormal where uh, before the, the shift goes from the bone marrow to the spleen, all the counts start to come down. So your white count starts to come down, your red cell count comes down, um, and so they have symptoms of fatigue, sweats, and then their, their abdomen gets very swollen. How hard is it to diagnose this if you're not with a, a specialist who has seen this disease before? It, it's fairly uncommon, and I think it is something that, you know, a pathologist who's gone through appropriate training should be able to diagnose, but it requires the physician to know to even look for it. You have to do a bone marrow biopsy to make the diagnosis. And so if you do the bone marrow biopsy, the diagnosis can be made. There's a lot of borderline cases where I would certainly recommend that a second opinion be obtained. Um, in all the blood cancers, I'll tell you that knowing exactly what kind you're dealing with is so important because there's so many different variations. What actually causes the scarring? Yeah, so that's a great question. And up until 2005, nobody really knew. And even now, there's still a big mystery. But what happened in 2005 is that um, a, a pathway was discovered. So inside the cancer cell, in myelofibrosis, it turns out that there is an abnormal pathway that's called JAK2, the JAK-STAT pathway. That's just the name of it. And when this pathway is out of control, the cells start to force uh, fibers into the bone marrow and will actually, it's the tumor secreting chemicals and cytokines that cause the scarring to happen. And it's, uh, but it has something to do with this pathway. And that leads us very directly into what was presented on uh, Saturday during the press briefing and then again today uh, in the oral sessions for myelofibrosis. And that is that we've never really had a good treatment for this disease. Uh, it is something that is very symptomatic. You know, the patients with the big bellies, you can't eat, you have sweats, you have fatigue and fevers. And really the treatment um, has been uh, just to treat the symptoms. We've never had a targeted treatment. And what happened after this discovery in 2005 that this JAK-STAT pathway was abnormal is that uh, people started to develop drugs that block the pathway. And it's remarkable that such a rare disease now has two large trials that compared a drug that blocks the JAK-STAT pathway versus either placebo or against the best available therapy. 
And in both of these studies, uh, the drug that was used, in this case it was a JAK2 inhibitor called ruxolitinib, but there's a couple other out there too. Hopefully they'll have less tongue twister names. Do we know who's at risk for this disease? Uh, no, we actually don't. It, age is a risk factor, but it is not hereditary. Is there a common profile? Is it more prevalent in, in, in men or women? And at what age? Right, so men and women are equally affected, and the average age is about 65. So it is a disease of older adults. There's, um, you know, you asked who else could get it. There are two other related disorders uh, called essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera, both of which can turn into myelofibrosis later. Uh, and anybody with myelofibrosis, one of the, the sort of side effects or long-term events that can happen is that sometimes these patients will develop leukemia from their myeloproliferative disorder. It sounds like there's great potential for these patients to be diagnosed later in their disease than earlier if right. it's so rare and mm -hmm. you first have to get to the bottom of it by even knowing what to suspect. That's correct. To do the testing that could lead to the diagnosis. I think awareness is, is not as strong as it is for some of the more common cancers. And what advocacy organization, uh, what umbrella would this fall under? Who addresses this disease? So Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and American Cancer Society and Lymphoma Research Foundation all have areas that are focused on what, you know, this, the, the bigger category that myelofibrosis falls into is something called myeloproliferative disorders. And one of the myeloproliferative disorders that you're more familiar with is CML chronic myelogenous leukemia. So that's actually a cousin of primary myelofibrosis. They both are bone marrow problems or bone marrow disorders where um, cells either grow out of control or they cause other uh, effects within the bone marrow. You know, you'll hear patients with the more, uh, the less common yeah. and rare cancers feeling like, you know, there's not much happening for us. How nice to hear about an advancement for one of the rare cancers that so many people have never heard of. I'll tell you, I am so impressed that within five or six years of knowing what an abnormality for this disease is, that there are now four targeted agents specifically for this very rare disease. You're on mm -hmm. the younger side of the medical mm -hmm. oncology community, right. which means as your career advances, it's your generation that's really going to just prosper and benefit from all of this. You are very lucky to be the age you are, mm -hmm. at the place you are in medicine. You have so many years ahead of you to be part of this really dynamic change.